Uh, I want to express my appreciation to Brother Wiley and the congregation of Richmond Hill uh, for this lectureship and for giving me the opportunity to certainly be a part of it. It's always a joy, and I really appreciate so much those of you who are here. Uh, what a joy it has been for me to hear these uh, speakers previously. I tell you, Brother Andrew and uh, Brother Stacy and Brother Caleb, uh, these men have done a great job. And I tell you, if you buy that book, uh, if you're a preacher or a teacher or you just want to have some good uh, study material at home, just get that lectureship book. Uh, because I, I said, uh, with all that material in it, uh, you know, uh, Brother Randy, there's enough material there for us to preach for the next three and a half, four years. Uh, and really appreciate uh, the effort that these men have put into this uh, book. I want to say amen as well. Uh, I'm going to do a commercial, Johnny. You don't have to pay me uh, but for the uh, Gospel Journal. Uh, I want to encourage you to subscribe if you have not already done so. Uh, it's an excellent publication, has been. Uh, I encourage our brethren at Lithia Springs to uh, participate in good uh, literature in their homes. And so certainly the uh, Gospel Journal is one of those. And I really appreciate uh, Brother Johnny and his work with that. And I know you will find it beneficial uh, as well. You know, to hear these good men, it can be sometimes, folks, intimidating. I mean, uh, you've got these men, they studied their subject well, and uh, I, I, thought about the, uh, I thought about the lady, she's about 75, 80 years old, driving down the expressway, and man, she was flying. I mean, she was going fast. Uh, Georgia Highway Patrol stopped her and pulled her over to the side and looked there, and, and as he went up to the car, and looked in the front seat, there was a, a, a 38 pistol laying in the front seat. And he said, ma'am, is, is that a pistol? She said, yes, sir, that's a 38, and I have a permit for it. She said, not only that, but she said, there is a 22 pistol in my glove compartment. I've got a permit for that. She said, in the trunk of my car, I've got a shotgun. He said, ma'am, what are you afraid of? She said, absolutely nothing. And so, uh, you know, you, you and I have certainly nothing for the Word of God to be afraid of. I appreciate the congregation and the leadership uh, of the Richmond Hill congregation and this lectureship. I thought about the, uh, the patrolman, uh, this guy flying down of the expressway, and he pulled him over. And uh, he said, man, I said, what in the world are you doing driving so fast? He said, look, officer, I'm just trying to keep up with traffic. And the officer said, man, there's not a car within a mile of you. He said, well, you see how far behind I am. So, uh, you folks are not behind. You're doing the work of the Lord. And I want to commend you and express my appreciation to you for giving me an opportunity to participate. In the book of John, chapter number 15, is going to be our focus in this lesson today. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the husband, but... Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean, that the word which I have spoken unto you abide in me, and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. But if a man abide not in me, and my words abide not in him, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if a man abide in me, and my words abide in him, he shall ask what he will, and it shall be done unto him. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now this is basically the introduction of John chapter number 15. As you and I look at this great book of the New Testament, written by a man who has written other books of the New Testament, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I look at John, and we look at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, and when you study John, and you study his writings, you must be impressed with several things that he incorporates within his writings. For an example, when you look at John, there are three words that are prevalent throughout his book. Uh, that is the word life, light, and also the word love. In the book of John chapter number 1, the Bible said, In him was life, and the life was the light of me. When you look at John chapter 1 and verse number 17, 
The Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth comes by Jesus Christ. In John 1 verse 29, you remember that John in his introduction said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. When you go to the book of John chapter number 3 in verse number 19, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. When you and I look at John chapter 10 and verse number 10, you'll find that the Bible says that I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And then, as Brother Caleb did so well in his lesson today in John 14, when Jesus said, I am the way again, we find the, the focal point on these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. When you go to the book of John again, chapter number 20, you'll find that many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but these are written that you might have life and that you might believe and that believing you might have life in his name. That you believe that Jesus is the Christ. That he is the Son of God. And that believing this, you might have life again in his name. And so when you look at these words, the word love, uh, he uses several times. Uh, we're going to point this out in just a second in John chapter 15. So when you read the book of John, and if you just write these three words, the word life, the word light, and the word love, then what you and I are going to be able to do, we're going to find that John, in his emphasis, helps us not only to have a life, that that life must be a part of Christ, and as a part of that, John 13, you remember, in John chapter 13, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you do what? If you have love one for another. So you and I see this all the way through the book of John. And that is again the word life, the word light, and the word love. Now I want you to focus with me. In John chapter number 15, I am the true vine, my father's husband. When you and I look at the 15th chapter of the book of John, and I appreciate it. Now follow up because if you will look in your Bible and uh, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, then what you're going to see is that John chapter 15 is a continuation of John chapter 14. When Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and then again, uh, I'm not going to try to redo Brother uh, Caleb's lesson. He did so well. Uh, I'm certainly not going to try to redo, but I, wanna, I just want to build on one of the points that he made. And that is the fact that as there may have been many who identified themselves as, quotation mark, a Christ, then when you come to John 15, verse 1, look at what the Bible, Jesus said, I am the, watch this, I am the true vine. I'm not a false vine. I am the true vine. It doesn't matter what other men have said. In Matthew chapter number 16, for example, when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? Some said, well, thou art Elias, or John the Baptist, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked the apostle, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so he said, blessed art thou, Simon, for Jonah, flesh and blood, hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so Jesus is asked, well, who do men say that I am? There were those who were saying certain things. Well, some say thou art John the Baptist, some are lies. Uh, you're one of the prophets. And so there is that idea that some are saying he is this or he is that or he is not this or that. And so Jesus in John 15 verse 1 says, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. When you and I look again at that word true, it shares with us the concept of then there is a fault. There are those who come along who are quotation marks, false prophets. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 1, verse 1 and 2, Peter said there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall also be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in them of heresy, even denying the Lord which bought them, and shall bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be spoken of. In 1 John 4, verse number 1, 
The Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Why? Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 7, you remember that Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, He said, You beware of what? Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. I believe another example of this is found in Galatians chapter number 1. When Paul said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert. Again, notice this word. And would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. So when you and I go back to John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the husband. You and I must recognize that there are those who are false prophets. There are those who are false teachers. There are those quotation marks who are false Christ who are trying to identify and have those follow after them rather than following after Jesus Christ who is the true vine. I am the true vine. My father is the husband. Every branch of me that bears no fruit, he take away. There are four things I want to identify here. There are four things that we want to put emphasis on. Number one is this, and that is when you and I look at Jesus Christ as being the true vine, that you and I can look at the life that is found. When Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. And so in order for us to be a part of that true vine, in order for us to have a life that is different, a life that is distinguished from what the world has to offer. Remember what John said in 2 John, or 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17? Love not the world, neither the things are in the world. If any man love the world, love the Father is not in. And so you and I look at this again, and what do we find? We find that in John chapter number 15, we find that Jesus says, here is how to have the true life of which I am speaking. I'm going to give you four things. Now, there's more than that uh, in this chapter. But I want, to, I want to emphasize four. Number one, this. In order for you and I to have a distinguished life in Christ, in order for you and I to recognize that He is the true vine, Christ must be the center of our life. When you and I look at John now 15, now you, you take the time, I, uh, you know you'll miss these words. You'll read a passage of Scripture and uh, you'll miss something. I mean, uh, you, you read a passage, you read it, you read it, you read it. Uh, I've gone through, underlined, circled, outlined, put marks, uh, trying to make sure, I, but now... Uh, I counted, I think, about 42 different times in John 15 in which the personal pronoun, I or me or Christ, is used in that passage. Notice that Jesus said, I am the true vine. My Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he saith what? Every branch that beareth fruit, he purchaseth it, that it may be, uh, bring forth more fruit than you claim through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I in you. And then he goes on down and he talks again about uh, my, my love. He talks about my commandments. He talks about my friends. And so when you and I look at John chapter number 15, we must recognize that Christ must be the center of our life. In the book of Colossians chapter number 3, the Bible says, if you then, now notice this, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. Notice that. He said you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, I cannot make that. I can. I cannot quote. I cannot make that statement without. Uh, remember. I was preaching not long ago at the Fayetteville Church of Christ, and uh, those brethren had that uh, had the PowerPoint, had the scripture on PowerPoint, 
Uh, you know, and, and I, I'm telling you the whole sermon. I didn't know this. The whole sermon. I was misquoting that verse. My wife told me, she said, would you quote that verse for me again? And I had missed it. I said, your, your life is hid uh, with Christ in God. Or, and I misquoted it. Uh, and so I want to make sure, you know, your life is hid with God. How about that? How does that come about? In Christ. It is in Christ that you and I have our life in God. You and I must remember that Christ is the center of of our life. And so in Colossians 1, when he said, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is, now notice again, when Christ who is your life shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. You and I, the center, the focus of my life, must be Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If it is, if we're displaying our own personal arrogance, if we're trying to, what did Jesus say in Matthew 5? He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. Absolutely not. Oh, how wonderful and great you are. No, no, no. That he may glorify how? That Christ may be glorified. And then he ignored this. He said, you seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of the throne of God. Now notice this. Not only do we seek, but we set our affection. <clears throat> again, Christ is the center of it. If you go back to the New Testament again, when you study in the book of Acts, chapter number 8, chapter number 9, chapter number 10, you find three conversions. The conversion of the Ethiopian unit, the conversion of Saul, and the conversion uh, of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the centurion. So you got three. You have the Ethiopian unit, Saul, uh, and the centurion in Acts chapter 10. When you and I look at those passages, what we find, the Bible says, you remember Philip uh, went to the chariot and he heard him read and he asked a question. Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired that Philip would come up and sit in the chariot with him. And the Bible said to give the same scripture, and he preached unto him Philip. No. He preached unto him what? Jesus. Now as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and he said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, how did he learn about that? Because Philip had preached unto him Jesus. He began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So in John 15, when Jesus said, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman, every branch in me. If you and I are of he that abideth in me, and I in him. If I abide in him, then therefore he is going to be the center of my life. I get amazed. I get, I get amazed that folks can come to the church building on Sunday morning and they can sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. But they don't love Him Sunday night. Isn't that amazing? Or they don't love Him on Wednesday night. I remember several years ago, there was a, and I may have told that, I don't know, folks, when, when you get up my age, it doesn't matter. I mean, these little birds go through your mind, you took one of them out. But I was preaching at a home congregation several years ago. And so, uh, I preached on attendance. And lo and behold, there were three ladies who responded to the invitation. A mother and her two daughters. Man, they cried a bucket of tears. We had a box of Kleenex. We filled a whole box. Oh, oh they're so sad. They're, oh, man, we missed the services. We're, we're so sorry. We're, we're going to do better. We prayed and cried. They didn't come back Sunday night. They didn't come back Wednesday night. They wouldn't even done next Sunday. Christ is center of my life. He began the same scripture. What did he do? He preached unto him Jesus. Go to the ninth chapter of Acts. What did Saul say? What would thou have me do, Lord? What did he learn? He learned of Jesus. And an eyes went to him and told him what to do in order to be saved. When you go to Acts chapter 10, you find that Cornelius had sent for Peter, and Peter came to tell him words whereby he and his house would be saved. What did he preach to him? He preached unto him Jesus. If you want to change the life of a man, you teach him about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen. The Bible says, if you then be risen with Christ, 
You can't rise with something when you haven't been buried. You can't rise. Do you remember? If you then be risen with Christ, then was that not what Paul said in the previous chapter, Colossians 2, in which he said we are buried with Him by baptism, that we are raised, and then he comes along in chapter 3 and he said, if you then be risen with Christ. You cannot be risen with Christ. See, again, is Christ the center? See, there are folks who say, oh, brother, Aker, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, uh, I believe Jesus is going to save me. Oh, I can fit it right here. Have you been baptized? Well, no, I ain't. I don't want to be baptized. Then Christ says, the center of your life. You're not, you haven't been risen with Him. You cannot be risen with Him until you have been buried with Him. And so when you and I look at this and we see that Christ is the center of our life, that we have been risen with Him, that we seek Him, that we set Him up, that we set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth, that you and I sanctify, we set apart, those things, our life, we're dead. We're here with Christ. And so then, when Christ too is your life. So when you and I look at John 15, and Jesus said, you're my friends. Jesus said, these are my commandments. Jesus talked about His love. And so when you see this 40-something times in this chapter, that the word I, or me, or my, or you, I asked the simple question this afternoon, does it not tell us that Christ must be the center of our life? When you and I assemble on the Lord's day, Christ is the center of our worship. Our affections are to be made known. We meet around the Lord's table. He is the center of it. We let our light shine. We are the salt of the earth. So Christ must be the center of our life. So, not only is Christ the center, but we also find that this distinguished life, which is centered in Christ, is anchored in His Word. Now notice what He said. I'm a true vine, my father's a husband. Every branch in me that bear not fruit take it away. Every branch that bear fruit he purchased it, that it may bear forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branch. He that abideth in me, and I in him. If a man abide not in me, and my words do not abide, and my words do not abide in him, he is just for the branch. You and I need to put emphasis in that this life that Jesus is speaking of in John chapter number 15 is anchored in His Word. You see, earlier in our study today, Brother Andrew pointed out the fact of John 12 verse number 48, in which Jesus made the statement, He said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I speak to you, they shall judge in the last day. And so the, the, our life must be not only centered in Christ, but it must be anchored in the Bible. Do you and I know the Bible? Do we know the Word of God? <laughs> and you can read this in the book. Uh, I think I made this statement about the guy said something to another member of the congregation about uh, Adam and Eve. He said, well, I didn't know they were members of our congregation. Now, that's about how something, you know, it reminded me of the fellow who thought Dan and Barry Sheep were husband and wife, like Solomon and Gomorrah. Well, there are some folks in their idea of the word, that's about how much they know of the Bible. I mean, they, I mean, they, it's kind of like there was a fellow um, on the Grand Ole Opry years ago, he's deceased now. His name is Johnny Russell. I don't know if any of you ever you know, been a cuff, I had to pay attention to the Grand Ole Opry. And I had to say something about it almost. But you know, uh, Johnny Russell was on the Grand Ole Opry for many years. Got a big, heavy guy, kind of a comedian. And so, uh, at any rate, one day I was at the Grand Ole Opry, we were on the stage there, and Johnny Russell was performing, and he and I were kind of standing off on the corner. He said, Larry, you know what? He said, I am so far from so far back in the country 
He said the books of the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, Big John, and Bubba. Well, uh, you know, that's the way some folks look at the Bible. Big John and Bubba is what they look at. They look at the Word of God. Well, it's kind of a good thing uh, to have. Now, when we have a wedding or we have a funeral, why the Bible is a good thing to have around. Now, you remember years ago? Uh, no, you won't remember. Now you're old enough. Years ago, they had these little buildings out from the house. Uh, and folks would go out there and contemplate. They'd sit out there a little while. And th there, was a, there was a book that everybody liked to read. And they even had one in the house. One, and then one day the preacher was visiting and, it, and the mama wanted to impress the preacher. And so she told her little boy, said, son, I want you to go get that book that we all love to read. So what, the little boy came back with then a series of robot catalog. Well, <laughs> now it'd be probably the TV guy. The Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp to my feet. It is a light under my pathway. David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. James says, Whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Whoever does what looks into the perfect law of liberty. The Bible said, Paul said to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom, preach your opinion. No, he said you preach the word. The is the in season out of Do you preach what somebody else? No, you preach the word of God. Listen, my friend, today there is a lack of the word of God emanating from the pulpit of our churches because men have not taken the time to study the Bible and then to preach it on the Lord's day. Yeah. Brother John Ramsey, I'm sure many of you heard Brother John Ramsey. What a powerful preacher. Folks have said if you took, if the Bible were destroyed, get Johnny Ramsey, and of course he's deceased now, and George Bailey, and they can put it back together. Brother Ramsey preached a sermon. I have to, I have notes. I remember he was preaching in the gospel meeting, and, and I, I, I wrote down point number one, and I wrote down every scripture he related, point number one. And he didn't, I mean, he related them. It wasn't just about saying, well, I want you to know how much I know. But then I, I wrote down 75 passages of scripture on point number one. But brother, I heard Brother Johnny tell about speaking at a uh, quotation mark, some preacher schools, and I, I don't know where that I'm name is, not yet going to that. Anyway, he had spoken, and after he had preached, one of the students came up and said, Now, Brother Ramsey, you, you just used too much scripture in your lesson today. He said, I, Don't you think it'd be, I, I just kind of thought you'd take a scripture exegeted, brother. Brother Randy said, and I didn't even know what exegete meant, but he <laughs> said, I thought you kind of had. He said, I asked that young man this question. Whose words are better, the words of men or the words of God? Ladies and gentlemen, is it not the word of God? Right. If my words abide in you, then you ask what you will. That we need not only to know the Word of God, but we need to preach the Word of God. And in Psalms chapter number one, remember what David said: "Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law." Doth he meditate day and night? That is that word. Take your Bible. I want you to turn to John chapter 15 for a second. And I want you to look down at verse number 10. And when you look at verse number 10, notice it says, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, what is that? That's his word. Psalm 119. Over and over again, his statute, his command, his law, his word. Look at the latter part of that verse. He said, kept my, uh, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. 
Uh, skip over to verse number 17. You look what the Bible says. These things I command you. Command. These things I command you. What? His word. And then you look at the next verse. Hey, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. How? Why is that? Because of the word. Skip down in verse number 25. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled. Look at verse number 20. Remember the word. So you and I, when you look at John chapter 15, as you and I uh, see the, the approaching end of the life on this earth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're the last week. Matthew 21 through Matthew 28, the last week of our Lord. Walking the last mile of the way in the footsteps and the footprints of Jesus. The only Jewish girl a little Jewish girl went down into the valley of the shadow of death. And when she came up, she was holding in her arms the Savior of the world. He is worth And so when you and I look at John 15, and Jesus said, If a man abide in me, and my words abide in him. So you and I, if we're going to live this life that Jesus is talking about, in the book of John, then not only is it going to be Christ-centered, it's going to be Bible anchored. And number three, it's going to be prayer supported. Now look what he said. He said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you shall do what? You shall ask what you will. And then in John 16, he supports that again. In John 15, 16, he supports that again. So what it, it is prayer supported. When you and I again look at the last few hours of the life of our Lord Jesus Christ, what did He do? He went into the Garden of Gethsemane. You read this in Matthew 26, Luke 22, Mark 14, John 18. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible says that He was, he was very sorrowful. What did He do? He prayed. He prayed. He came back and had gone to sleep. He goes back again and a second time. What did he do? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Then let's not my will but thy be. Three times he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he fell once on his face, or the Bible said on his knees and fell down to the ground. Three times he prayed. What did he do? He prayed. Jesus Christ was up all night in prayer before he selected his apostles. Jesus Christ said, Can you not watch with me? Watch therefore and pray that you be not led into temptation. What do we need to do? We need to watch and do what? We need to pray. That's what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Paul said in Romans, continuing instant in prayer. That's what James said in James 5, in which he said, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible tells us in Acts 2 and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in what? In prayer. <clears throat> Do we pray? Oh, yes. Lord, let me, my wife, my son, John, his wife, that's Lord all. Do we pray? The Bible says in James, the Bible tells us that Elijah was a man of like passion. He had passion in his prayer. If you want to read two great prayers, go to 1 Kings chapter number 18. You remember when he confronted the 450 priests of Baal. Prayers do not have to be long to be effective. I thought about the brother, Brother B.J. Clark, I love this. Uh, he, brother B.J. Clark was holding a meeting somewhere. And uh, the brother who was leading the prayer prayed, Lord, help. And he forgot Brother Clark's name. What he was going to say, help him to have a ready recollection. And I, I, listen, I'm grateful to the men who pray for us, aren't we, Brother Riley, that we'll have a ready recollection of the thing we're going to say. But at any rate, he was praying, and, and he wanted to pray that God would give Brother Clay, but he couldn't remember his name. And so he just said, Lord, I pray that 
he'll have a better recollection than I've got on him. <laughs> he'll remember what it might be. Prayers don't have to be long. They don't have to be loud. All thou holy and mighty God. It's, the Bible recognizes this. I, I know that. Don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not, I'm not denigrating the fact that in our praise of this high and holy God. But you know what? Elijah said, God, I'm doing this, you'll be. You can read that prayer in 30 seconds. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stone, left up the water. I believe Elijah prayed a little bit longer and more in the latter part of that chapter. He was persistent in his prayer. I believe the position, you know, you look at that and, and you see again, he went up on Mark, uh, Mount Carmel in the place that he prayed, his persistence in it. Praying. Send a servant out there, and the servant comes back and says, I don't see anything. He kept praying, the servant goes back, and I don't see anything. He keeps praying, comes back. After seven times, Servant came back and said, oh, yeah, there's a hand out there. It looks like it's going to rain. He told him, oh, hey, you better get ready, man. It's going to rain. And so when you and I look at the life that's found in Christ, if you and I look at Jesus Christ, who is the center of our life, when we look and have this distinguished life, that it's Christ-centered, that it is Bible-anchored, that it is prayer-supported, and that it is fruit bearing. Now notice, go back with me to John chapter 15. In which he said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. You know what that fruit is? That's another Christian. He said, I am the true vine, my father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you can go down in John chapter number 15 and you'll find again that he used that word fruit. The fruit is, that we as children of God are to bear fruit. You know what? Not many Christians do that. Not many Christians bear fruit. Not many Christians bring up. Now I realize that not every child of God is going to be, uh, in quotation marks, a, a personal evangelist to the extent they're going to baptize 100 people every year. But listen, you and I must be instrumental in bringing others to the cause of Jesus Christ. One at a time. Oh, we like big things. We like them at Lithia Spring. I'm sure you do. Brother Ben McKnight taught how to do personal evangelism. And he'd go, he, he went throughout the United States and they do these seminars on personal back. I mean, he'd get you fired up if you listen to him. I remember the first time I heard his lesson number one, that tape. Uh, this was back in the 60s. I gave a fellow $10. I said, I'll give you $10 that tape. Man, I got hundreds of thousands of dollars of what value out of that tape. I wore it out. But I remember something he said. He was holding a meeting. And he went home with a preacher every night at church. And he said, we'd sit down at the table and he called it, do up a cup of coffee. And he said, we'd do up a cup of coffee. And so while the preacher was getting the coffee ready, he said, uh, I looked at the cap on that coffee and it was Sanka. Then, you know, Sanka had just come out. Man, it was very popular. And he said, you know what, brother? He said, this reminds me of my brethren. And, and the brother said, well, what's that? And he said, well, it says on the top of this lid, 98% of the active ingredients have been removed. That's the way it is with some Christians. Fruit bearer. Herein. Now listen to this. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's the prayer. Herein is my Father glorified. God is glorified. When you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciple. John 15. In order for us to be the kind of Christian, to live that distinguished Christian life, it must be Christ centered, by the way, prayer supported, fruit Thank you, Thank you, Brother Amen. We appreciate that class. We're talking about Brother Ramsey. We're still Brother Ramsey passed away.